Okay, my name is Joan Valk. I'm one of the adult programming librarians at the uh, St. Mary's County Library. I'd like to welcome Jim Gibb this evening. He is going to do another one of his archeology span presentations. Tonight's presentation will be Southern Maryland, 2000 BC. And uh, Jim, for those of you who don't know him, I know a lot of the people in the group tonight do know Jim. He is the director of the Smithsonian Environmental Archaeology Laboratory at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Annapolis. And he's joining us from his home in Annapolis this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, let everybody know that you are more than welcome to leave your video screens on. Jim likes to see everybody that is in the group and um, just turn off your audio, put that on mute. If you have any questions while he's giving his presentation, feel free to jump in and ask your questions. Or if you would rather type it into the chat, you may do that as well. And at the end of the program, I'll just go and read off all of the questions so that he can um, speak to anybody. But, but these programs are pretty laid back. So just feel free to jump in anytime. So with that, Jim, welcome. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, good to see at least some of you. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about, uh, I think this is the first time in this lecture series I've talked about Native Americans. Uh, so as I go along, I'll be introducing a couple of concepts. Some of you are probably familiar with them, but I'm sure not everybody is. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'll do this one here. And there we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So uh, the title looks a little weird. Maryland 2000 BC brackets E. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll adjust that in, in a moment. So we're looking at archaeologists very often use the term prehistory to refer to Native Americans in the New World. I don't use that term. And I don't use it because I think it's pejorative. Uh, what we mean by prehistory is pre-European contact. Native Americans have a history. Um, it's not written down, but yet, but yet they have a history. So I tend to talk about Native American history uh, whether it's during a period when uh, written documents are created and collected or not. Uh, we don't have a good, really good sense yet of how long Native Americans were here. Typically, we say since the end of the Ice Ages, uh, approximately 11,400 years ago. However, throughout the New World, there are a few sites, a handful of sites, where we clearly have evidence or we're pretty sure we have evidence of people living here thousands of years earlier. Uh, this is new work. It's been going on uh, for the last 10 years or so intensively. Uh, I don't know enough about it to talk about it, and we're going to focus on only one period this evening anyway, and it's not the very early one. Uh, these folks left no written record. Um, as a result, we don't even know what they call themselves. We don't know what languages they spoke thousands of years ago. Um, and that, because of that, archaeologists applaud, we create categories, we create what we call archaeological cultures, and I'll get into that in a moment, and it sort of impose them on the past. Uh, we don't have a medieval period. We don't have a, a Roman period, a late Roman period, an early Roman period. You know, those, those periods that are supported by written documents simply uh, can't be used when looking at Native American history. All we have is really the trash they left behind. Uh, the artifacts that they discarded because they were broken or worn and refuse that they simply had no other use for and what we call features. And features are things like fireplaces, storage pits, post holes perhaps where wooden posts were used to support buildings and other things. Uh, the first written accounts we have, of course, are provided by Europeans and they date to the 16th century. There are a few uh, bits, mostly Spanish explorers uh, that made it up into the Chesapeake. But really, um, things get going in terms of written documentation with 
uh, the Jamestown settlement of 1607, and Captain John Smith kind of cruising up and down the Chesapeake Bay, making a map uh, and uh, meeting Native American uh, groups. Um, we have and you know, we have all kinds of questions, but to me, some of the basic questions are: How did you get? How did a very small number of very small groups of people from Asia, how did they populate the entire New World in an incredibly short period of time, under a thousand years, certainly? And then how did they develop into the very complex and multifaceted cultures that Europeans encountered uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries? The topic for tonight is the late archaic period, and particularly what we call the terminal archaic or transitional. And this, this is a really fascinating period because it marks a time when throughout the region, we have lots of groups who are going from fairly small groups, still kind of bopping around the countryside to ones that form what are effectively villages on a seasonal basis and then break up into smaller groups during other seasons. Uh, and it's also a period when we start to see the beginnings of if not agriculture, what we might call horticulture, sort of gardening and uh, promoting uh, local plants that are edible. Uh, we can't recover languages that are unwritten. I don't think that'll ever happen unless somebody develops a time machine and we can actually go in the past and, and record what people are saying and create dictionaries. I don't think that's very likely. It's great science fiction, but probably quite unrealistic. Uh, but we can reconstruct the histories, I think, of individual communities within particular areas of, say, Southern Maryland. And so that's what my focus is this evening. Um, yeah, this, is, this is Captain John Smith's map of uh, oh, 1612 or so, I guess he made it. And it's hard to see. Let me look, I'm going to focus on that red rectangle there. He documented all these different groups here. Let me get a pointer. So each of these names represents a village, which also in a sense represents not really a tribe, not really a nation. We don't really have a good European concept for it. Uh, we tend to talk about tribes, but that's essentially a European concept. Uh, just as, you know, sort of a, a chief, a head person is very much a European concept. But a lot of these, Europe, uh, these Native American groups had several leaders whose authority depended on the circumstance, whether it was largely ritualistic or war or diplomacy or, or whatever. But it's very clear that when the Europeans first got here, there were these villages all over the place and they weren't necessarily concentrated villages. Some extended a mile or more along a creek. Uh, so very just some were very dispersed and some were you know, like stockaded almost within a fort. So we'd like to see how this, these particular social formations, how, how, how they came about. So a few concepts before we begin, we'll start off with calend uh, calendrics. Um, in the typical European system, we use a Christian calendar and dates are expressed as AD or uh, Anno Domini or BC before Christ, uh, just as a matter of style, AD always precedes the date, BC always comes after. Uh, there's no such thing as the year zero AD or AD zero. You're either at AD one or BC one. There's no zero in there. Uh, archaeologists make that mistake all the time. But what we've tried to do uh, is switch to a more universal system. It's still very much based on a Christian calendar. But now we use the terms common era, like this is 2021. CE of the common era or before the common era. And these are essentially the same as AD and BC. Um, but that's, those are the terms we're using. And in that case, whether it's CE or BCE, they always follow uh, the year. In terms of other concepts, we deal with archeological cultures uh, and those are based on styles of artifacts. So if we find a bunch of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, projectile points or arrowheads that are triangular shaped, and we find them throughout an area, 
that constitutes an archaeological culture. They, they, what they thought of as an arrowhead had to be triangular. To them, that was what was appropriate. Uh, and then if we find these arrowheads in association with a hearth, for instance, that has charcoal, we can radiocarbon date it and therefore say, okay, the people who use triangular projectile points, they were here during these particular years. Uh, and then we give it a name. You know, we'll call it the, uh, the Sullivan phase of the late woodland, um, archeological jargon that defines these, the archeological culture. But the terms we're using are not those that would have been used by Native Americans. There's something we've imposed on the past. Uh, napping, uh, spelled without the K, is what some of you will be doing during the car course of this hour. Uh, hopefully not too many. If you stick a K in front of it, that means that's, that's the verb we use when we refer to making stone tools, making tools out of cobbles. And then uh, the subject tonight, the terminal archaic tra or transitional period, they're, they're essentially synonymous. Uh, that's a period of roughly uh, 3000 BC to 750 BC, if we want to use those, uh, that form, when there's a significant change in cultures and even pretty strong evidence that we have groups of people moving up from the south, what are now southeastern United States, into this region bringing new technologies and new ways of living uh, and presumably displacing or somehow merging with the folks that are already here. We don't know. Uh, but we get changes in how people live together, how they make a living and the technologies that they use. Uh, what's really interesting is that this period is not only coincident with people moving up from Georgia area, Carolinas, it's also a period when sea levels were rising rapidly. Remember the ice, the glaciers recede uh, as they melted, uh, the oceans of the world rose, okay? We get rising sea level. That sea level inundated uh, what is now, the, what was the Susquehanna River and is now the Chesapeake Bay. And I'll have an image of that in a moment, show you what that's all about. So in terms of our chronology, we start with the Paleo-Indian period, 11,400, which is about the end of the ice ages, to around 7,500 uh, 7, before the common era. So we have these periods. They're represented by certain vegetation regimes, although starting with the transition terminal archaic, we get what is essentially the environment we see today, although in terms of vegetation, we've changed that a lot. And, and fauna as well, you know, pretty much deer, beaver, woodchuck, that sort of thing. So this is, this in, in light blue, this is the area we're focusing on. And it, it occurs at a time when the environment that we have today is relatively speaking, the environment that the, that, that period, uh, of that period. So in terms of archeological cultures, just as an example, these are called um, Paleo-Indian points. Uh, some of them are referred to as Clovis points, Balsam points, but they're these large lancelet shaped blades often made out of very nice uh, material, flints and chalcedonies and such, cherts. These projectile points, and they were used for spears or darts, not arrows, they're way too big for arrows. Uh, they, we find them up and down throughout North America and South America. There are, vari there are variations in what they look like, but they, the appearance of this particular style throughout, North, uh, throughout the Americas suggests that it was a series of related people who came over and very quickly dispersed, but in small groups. So they weren't developing new technologies very quickly, They're just very small groups where you're not gonna see a lot of innovation. And that, again, is from around 11,400 to about 7,500 before the Common Era. This is another group of projectile points. I picked this up uh, off the website, which I provided here. You can um, search on jeffpat.org, and you can find a very nice website that shows all kinds of projectile points and Indian pottery types that you can look at. And if you have stuff at home, you can compare what you have 
to the website. It's a wonderful resource. It's used not only in this region, but it's, uh, people around the archaeologists around the country use it. Uh, but it's pretty easy to find and pretty easy to use. But this is these are a series of projectile points that we're a little uncertain about what they date to. It could be late archaic, they might be middle archaic, but they're a type of point that when we find, we go, ah, that's a Brewerton point. And the style was first defined up in upstate New York um, by an archaeologist, and we find this similar type up and down the East Coast. And then points that we've collected locally, that, you know, come from a local archaeological site. These are more typical with the, of the kind that we're going to be looking at this evening. These are from the terminal archaic period, a period of significant uh, transition in terms of settlement patterns, technologies, subsistence patterns, etc. And you know, you look at them, all kinds of not these. These are bifaces. These are essentially stone knives. But the rest of these, you could see, are, they have a stem on them that they would uh, be uh, fixed to a dart with. They fair, these. This group is fairly narrow blades. Uh, they're all considered more or less the same type and date to about the same period. In terms of napping, I uh, stole this image. Actually, I stole it from Jefferson Patterson Park Museum in Calvert County, and, and they stole it from the Illinois State Museum. But you can see we got this fellow banging away at a piece of rock and knocking flakes off that stone and then trimming them up with the you know, stone hammer and in some cases using perhaps an antler or very uh, fire hardened wood to apply pressure to the edges of the flake to make a serrated sharp edge. And I've got some more detailed views of what that looks like. I'm going into this because these flakes and the rejected flakes, those that aren't of any value, are largely what we find on these sites. We find very few what we call formal tools like projectile points. So here you got a core, it's from a you know, large pebble. You knock these flakes off and you could refit them together. And it has certain, I won't go into the details, but the creation of these flakes creates certain landmarks on the stone that help us distinguish human-made flakes from naturally broken stone. And here I've got two slides that show you sort of the progression. You knock a flake off, right, off a cobble. And then maybe you chip a little few pieces off on both sides, making a sharper edge. And maybe you do it around the entire perimeter of the flake on both sides. Eventually, you end up with something like this, which is a very useful tool. It has a nice sharp edge. But you can continue, this, this image here is gonna show up on the next one. Um, you've got this piece here and you can continue to shape it and sharpen it and eventually maybe notch it or somehow turn that into a projectile point. At each of the previous stages, it's a perfectly usable cutting tool. And pro people probably carried several of these on their person as, as cutting tools when they needed them and when somebody needed a projectile point to go on an arrow or a dart or, or spear, they simply chipped it a little more, made a notch so they could lash it onto a stick, and there you have it. So this, this outline shows you what was produced uh, eventually from a flake. And so here's uh, a view of some of the um, kinds of things we're going to be looking at. And we've got these narrow bladed um, projectile points and we have these what we call broad, uh, broad spears here. These type of points, these two groups show up on these sites. The broad ones are the ones that appear to have come, uh, well, have been brought uh, by people from the South, what is now the Southeastern United States. And here's how these things would be affixed. You'd put your point on a foreshaft, which attaches to a dart. Uh, and then it goes on to this throwing stick, which has a stone weight, on, uh, stone weight on it right over here. And we find these archeologically, some of them were beautifully polished stone, but it serves as a weight. And you can see in this drawing how this guy's holding this thing. By using that throwing stick, he essentially is giving his arm an extra joint, is making his arm longer and adding a joint. So these darts could be thrown with incredible power and accuracy. 
and are quite effective at uh, killing deer and other animals. So effective that although the bow and arrow appears to have been known for millennia, it wasn't in this area probably until around, I don't know, the uh, 1,000 uh, common era, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, that people around the Chesapeake started adopting a bow and arrow. This this uh, otl otl and uh, dart approach was very effective. I won't be talking about this this evening, but uh, also showing up in this period, the terminal archaic, we get a lot of uh, what we call ground stone, or, or uh, which would be those those weights on the otl otl but also these soapstone vessels where they quarry a stone. It's essentially talc, and it's very soft. You can actually cut it with your fingernail. And using a sharp stick or a sharpened piece of bone, you can actually carve a block of this stuff into a bowl. Uh, this material shows up, in, uh, shows up through Maryland, up through New England. Uh, there were, used to be quarries of it in Ellicott City. Right around Ellicott City, it was used to make uh, mostly griddles. Uh, actually, they're great for making pancakes. The only problem is they have asbestos in them, so they're probably not very healthy. Anyway, so again, this is the period we're dealing with, the transition, terminal archaic, around 2500 to 750 before the Common Era. Uh, I mentioned earlier that as sea levels rose, what was the Susquehanna River, which extends all the way up into central New York, uh, Cooperstown, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is, uh, it, it extends through New York and Pennsylvania down through uh, Maryland. And the dark blue here is the deep part of the channel in the Chesapeake Bay. That's probably pretty much the course of the Susquehanna River before it was inundated by rising sea levels. So what is now the bay was just a river and there was a lot more land around it. There was also a lot more land along the coast too, that uh, 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 continental shelf, a lot of that was exposed. With sea levels rising, that means we've lost a lot of archeological sites, they're underwater. And probably a lot of them simply eroded away. So we're losing a lot of the early sites. On the other hand, as the bay formed and matured at which it did about 3000 years ago, new communities of life occupied it. That's when we get oysters. You know, oysters don't occupy a freshwater river. It's when the bay forms and we get rising uh, salinity levels, increasing salt in the water, that we get populations like oyster and uh, various sorts of anadromous fishes, which come up off the bay and up into the tributaries like the Potomac and the Patuxent rivers and, and spawn. So the formation of the bay created an entirely new environment, an incredibly rich environment. And even when Europeans got here, they were just amazed at what was available. The, the, the streams, even with Indians uh, harvesting you know, fish and oysters, there were still huge amounts of food ready for the taking. And it was a major attraction to Europeans uh, who very often had a hard time making a living. And here food was ready uh, for the taking. And to a certain extent, that's still true in the United States for a good part of this country. Food is cheap, housing's expensive. In many parts of the world, food is very expensive. Housing such as it is, is not nearly so. So we get these large quantities of herring that you know, come up the rivers in the spring to spawn. And it's just a, a huge amount of food. And all you need are dip nets. You go out there. I mean, you'll see guys out there now in April fishing with rod and reel, but you can go out there with dip nets and just score lots and lots of these fish. George Washington uh, did this at Mount Vernon. You know, it was all hands on deck when the herring and shad were coming up river. Uh, he probably a major source of income for his plantation were these spring fish runs. They'd salt the fish and they use them to feed the enslaved population at Mount Vernon and sell the surplus to other plantations. So it was a rich source of food, even into the historic period. I'm gonna talk about two sites where we have these terminal archaic sites, that, sites I've worked on. Fairly briefly about the first one. This one is uh, up in uh, Cecil County, right along uh, the uh, Susquehanna River. Uh, Conowingo Dam is right here. Um, Havre de Grace is just downstream a few miles. 
And the site that we dealt with is on this floodplain here where the Octorero Creek comes into the Susquehanna River. So you got two bodies of water coming in. You know, it's a very potentially very rich environment. Uh, just a view of Octorero Creek today. Normally I don't show site locations because we want to protect them, but this one now is a baseball field. So uh, it's, it's not endangered, it's, it's gone. This is the site as we mapped it. And I won't go into a lot of detail here, but all the squiggly lines in here, these are concentrations of artifacts that we found through shovel testing. And I'll talk more about this uh, with the site uh, down in Charles County. But what's interesting is when we map these clusters out, we also mapped in the topography. And if you see here, there's these two dashed lines. This is sort of a low spot and it comes around and up to the, towards the road. This is a relic stream channel. This probably was the course of Octorero Creek at some time in the past. And these concentrations of artifacts show up right on the edge of it. That suggests that these two, two sites or two locuses of a particular site were located right on the banks of what was then the Octorero Creek, which has since shifted southward or westward. And here you can see we're out, actually it was just, you know, uh, a field just had been cut, but you could see this dark area here around the excavators. That's where the water still accumulates. That is the relic stream channel. Now, how old is it? We don't know, it probably dates to the site. But if we took a backhoe and dug a trench across it and got to that, we'd see that stream channel in profile of the trench. If we found pieces of wood in the bottom of it, and I've done this up in New York State, we recovered remains of a beaver dam. We could take that wood, which is unburned, it looks really fresh, it's just been in an oxygen, low oxygen environment, so it's preserved. We could send that out for radiocarbon dating. And if we date the wood, we date when that channel was active. Uh, so that would have been an interesting thing to do here. We didn't. And that particular excavation unit down below the plow zone, we found these rocks, and I'll be talking about that in a minute, firecrack rock from uh, hearths, also a projectile point just kind of symbolized here, and a stone knife here. So we're finding the remains of a camp, a Na Native American camp, that based on the projectile points we found dates to the terminal archaic period. In other words, you know, about four, three, uh, three, 4,000 years ago. And just a sample of the kinds of artifacts we were finding. Remember, these are those narrow bladed, uh, late archaic or transitional points, as well as some stone knives and whatnot. And a sort of a rough odd auto weight here. So this is the site I really wanted to talk about. This is um, in Charles County. Uh, to the left, beyond the woods, is Mattawoman Creek. And again, with my little white arrows here, you can see it's got a darkish area here. This is a relic stream channel. And uh, there are developments, residential developments throughout the area, so a lot of it's been destroyed. But there's a turf farm nearby where you can actually walk over there and see this large stream valley that once was. And now the only time there's water in it is if, if we get a heavy rain. But this is, was a stream channel and eventually that stream migrated in another direction. But at the time this was active, this area right in the foreground was occupied by Native Americans. Here's a map of it. There was a tobacco barn there and they're pretty well dilapidated. You could see all these small open circles here. Those are our shovel test pits. They're less than a foot in diameter, a foot and a half in diameter. And they go down a foot, two feet, whatever. We screen the soil, we recover the artifacts. And so we've gridded out the site and uh, excavated all of these uh, and collected the artifacts. As an example, the kinds of stuff we found this is, this, these are flakes. This is the debris left over from making stone tools. We know they're flakes because it, you don't really see it in the photograph, but if you look at them carefully and feel them, you could see all the landmarks on them that I mentioned earlier. 
that indicate that these are human-made and not uh, just rock naturally uh, fracturing. And we get those from a lot of the shovel test pits. If we take the numbers of flakes recovered or the weight of flakes recovered from shovel test pits, feed it into a, a computer program that does what we call trend surface analysis, we can essentially create a contour map. Now these gray lines here, these are elevation contours, that's just topography. The blue here though, indicate where the concentrations of uh, stone flakes are on this site. And that suggests that this is the site right here. This is where it's clustered. So much so you see one, two, three, these three squares here, those are the excavation units we actually uh, dug, uh, three foot by three foot units we dug later to test the deposits. This group of artifacts, are, these, are, these are firecrack rocks. These are coarse quartzite cobbles for the most part, uh, pebbles, about the size of your fist or bigger. And they'd be heated up in the fire. And then they would be put into various sorts of containers that were waterproof. You might have a basket that's got to, uh, pitch on the outside to make it waterproof. Uh, you could do the same thing with wood. But basically, you put your stew makings inside this pot that you couldn't possibly put on the fire because it would go up in flames. You heat up the rocks and drop them in. That boils the liquid, which cooks the food. Now, you, once the rock cools down, you take it out, you put it back in the fire, heat it up again, et cetera. Eventually, these rocks fracture. They explode from thermal shock. And so we find a lot of these broken rocks. On sites of this period, we also find them forming pavements. It's like somebody made um, uh, like a concrete pad in the back in your backyard, a patio of these cobbles and built large fires on them. They show up along these creeks in sites of this period. We suggest that they were roasting platforms, possibly the roast flesh, um, but I suspect more likely um, roots from various sorts of marsh plants uh, or uh, the other parts of plants to make fiber, to make clothing, to make rope, etc. cetera. Uh, so th these large concentrations of firecracked rock are really typical of the term of archaic. And if we look at a concentration of them too, it's the same area where that firecracked rock is concentrated. So clearly the site is here the uh, Rel Extreme channel is just off the picture to the right. Hopefully we'll get back there and do more extensive excavation someday. and We'll extend our topographic mapping so we can also pick up that stream channel and maybe also dig a backhoe channel, uh, trench through it and see if we can't find some material, plant material we can radiocarbon date so we could date the, uh, when that channel was active. And if we pull those both together, the, the flake distributions, the firecrack distribution, distributions, they're, they're basically occupy the same space. They're a little bit different, but they're pretty close. So clearly that is the site. And when we dig excavation units, I think this is Sarah Grady, the top of her, her head we're looking at, but you could see she's troweling down to make a nice clean wall here so we could do a nice drawing of it. But this upper lighter material, that's the plowed soil. Uh, you know, that's, that was up in, in cultivation until fairly recently. Uh, Below that is what we call the subplow zone. This is soil that had not been disturbed by plowing. And that's where these concentrations of material occur. The plow has damaged some of it. It's pulled some of that material to the top. And that's why we find artifacts in the upper part of the soil column in the plow zone. But we actually have intact deposits below the plow. And this is material that as far as we could tell at this point is exactly where Native Americans left it three or 4,000 years ago. I think that's exciting. Uh, the images below, these are just, uh, we dug three of these three foot by three foot excavation units, and they just show you schematically the soil profile. The upper stuff is plowed. The next layer is also plowed, but it's an older plow zone. You can just see this dark material here behind Sarah's legs. But below that is where we have what used to be a topsoil and in which we find these Native American artifacts. Uh, I'm gonna, there we go. 
this is a list of the artifacts we've got. I wonder if I can move this. Really. Okay. Um, so we have, well, I think, eight, 16 different categories here, a total of almost 2,500 artifacts from these units. We get firecrack rock, which is a substantial part, but not the majority. We have a couple of firestones, and all these are pebbles that clearly have been heated. They're reddened. They just hadn't exploded. They hadn't become firecrack rock yet. But for all practical purposes, they're the same as firecrack rock. We have uh, half a dozen cores, and these are pebbles that have been broken off, uh, quartz or quartzite pebbles that have been broken, and from which you could see clearly several flakes have been removed to make stone tools. Uh, we have a, you know, one pebble that's of a material that was almost certainly collected to be turned into stone tools. They simply hadn't done anything with it yet. We have a couple of hammer stones, and these are just pebbles with battered ends. So you could clearly see they were used as hammers. And then we have a series of flakes from decortication, the initial removal of the kind of rind of the stone, the breaking of the stone, to primary flakes, the big flakes you want to make tools out of, secondary, tertiary, shadow. These are just parts of making a stone tool, uh, the waste that, that uh, results. We have four of these used flakes, which are flakes that have edges that have been damaged. Clearly, we used for cutting something. Uh, a biface, you know, it's 10 bifaces, which are essentially um, knives, stone knives that could be projectile points someday, and 10 projectile points, these points that tip darts uh, or spears, and then a couple of scrapers. So we have a bunch of different tools here uh, and a lot of material. Um, I had a question, Jim. Yeah. Um, so I know I had this question before, and I just thought other people might be wondering the same thing. When I think pebble, I think of something like the size of a pea, but um, I know there's like a definition of pebble that is a lot larger that people would actually use as like a hammer or something. So what's like the approximate size yeah. of a pebble? The uh, geologists have very specific uh, size classes. Uh, what they refer, what they regard as cobbles are actually the little bits, mm -hmm. and a pebble is something that's essentially fist size or larger. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it gets to a point where it's no longer a pebble; it's a boulder. Uh, mm -hmm. But the geologists have um, definitions for all this, and they have certain very uh, well defined size classes that they use. Mm -hmm. So I know it is a little counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but. In fact, if you look at early hominid stuff from, uh, from uh, Africa, uh, those tools were referred to as pebble tools, pebble choppers, et cetera. So the archeologists working there in the uh, early to mid 20th century, you know, referred to these things as pebbles. And so we continue that use. That answer your question? Sorry, it's not, sorry it's not intuitive, but there's a lot about science that isn't intuitive. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I, yeah, it's not going here. Hello. Trying to advance my uh, slide and it's not working. Uh, some of the, these Zoom toolbars really get in the way. Uh, so here's some of the tools we recovered from just those few units. The one up in Cecil County, we had a whole bunch of tools, but we excavated, I think, a total of 20 of these three foot by three foot units. And on this site, we only dug three plus our shovel test pits. But again, you could see these you know, stemmed narrow bladed points, but also one of these um, Brewerton points from an, uh, perhaps an earlier period. Just upslope from the site, we were recovering artifacts. And I think this one came from further upslope. Uh, it is a multi-component site. We do find other periods there, but I think uh, the bulk of it dates to this terminal archaic period. And of course, you could see a hammer stone here, and this is what we would call a pebble. Now we see bifaces here, uh, you know, that one step away from being made into projectile points, but very serviceable knives. And this is a sort of a large kind of chopper type implement. Hmm, that thing stopped working. I have to do it the hard way. Um, 
interesting. Uh, yeah, we were doing that project as a, as a commercial project because some developer wanted to redevelop that site, that property. Well, we had another client just up the road from there and on the other side of the road up into uh, away from Mattawaman Creek, up onto some higher grounds, a wooded area that some other developer, uh, that's a, uh, a wooded area that they, they wanted to develop into resi uh, a residential subdivision. So we shovel tested and we found, this is the road here. We knew about, we've got two historic sites and I'm not gonna talk about those. But through our shovel testing, we found two other sites. These are our shovel test pits. Those circles that are filled with red or on this side blue, those are shovel test pits that produced artifacts, mostly flakes, some firecrack rock. And so on these two landforms, we've got two of these sites that date to the same period as the one down by Mattawoman Creek, but they're different. Yeah, it's just a, it's nice open woods, beautiful place really. And here is just large a view of where these sites are. There's a stream running down here into a larger creek and even a smaller uh, drainage coming down. So. Typically where two streams come together is a pretty good chance of finding a Native American site. Jim, I think you, you have uh, stopped your video somehow while you were advancing your uh, PowerPoint. Okay, let me figure out how to do this then. Um, Which is fine. I just wanted to let you know. Oh, you, you can't see me. Right. Well, okay. It's okay. I was able to see you up in the corner, but now I can't see you anymore. Yeah, my, it's black on mine too. You know what I look like. Okay. Um, but th th this is the combined material we got from those two sites. We only have 101 artifacts. We have firecrack rock. We have flakes that represent different stages of turning a pebble into an artifact. We have one projectile point, one biface. So the numbers of objects, and we didn't do any excavations, just shovel testing, but it's pretty clear that there's a lot less material, that these are smaller sites, possibly occupied for shorter periods or more likely occupied by smaller groups of people. And they're not, you know, we don't see the same range. You know, there were 16 different classes in that site down by the creek. These two sites combined only have eight. So, you know, if you think of uh, a house, just a dwelling house, there's certain kinds of objects in there. If that object is, if that house is part of, um, let's say a, uh, a farm, a farmstead, you're gonna find a much broader range of uh, artifacts from you know, agriculture, from take care of animals, machinery, uh, devices used to cultivate, plant, et cetera. Um, and so I think what we've got is these two sites there's a, a much narrower range of activities going on. And here's a comparison. Uh, the so-called Westwood site, which is the one by the creek, it's on a creek side as opposed to being an upland site by a spring. 2,500 artifacts as opposed to 101 artifacts. 15 classes, I thought 16, 15 classes as opposed to eight classes of objects. Specialized tools, those scrapers I mentioned for the other site. Uh, we had got those at West at the Creekside site. In this, uh, these two upland sites, we don't have any scrapers. Uh, both sites have these more generalized tools, bifaces and projectile points. So that suggests we have two different classes of site. And this is a model that uh, Archaeologists have been fooling around with for a number of years. This one specifically is, uh, was developed by uh, Dr. Jay Custer at University of Delaware. And what he says, and, and what a number of us kind of accept too, is that we have these large, you call here macro base camps, these, these uh, sort of almost temporary villages that a number of groups come together at. In this case, probably during the spring when the shad and herring are coming up the creek. And the reason they come together, these small groups come together is to exchange information, to kind of reestablish their relationships with one another. And the most important thing, of course, is if you have a group of, you know, 10 to 20 people living in a small camp, eventually you're gonna have children. 
And those children are going to get to an age when they start looking at the opposite sex. And in a group of 20 people, the chances of there being a, an available partner are probably not very great. So if these groups come together seasonally with a bunch, you know, then it's an opportunity to find mates for your children, essentially. So there's one good reason for bringing them all together, but also at these um, sites that are very rich in resources and particularly during the fish runs in the spring. And so what we probably got are these kind of base macro base camps, this is groups coming together and people leave that base camp, you know, during the day or maybe for overnight stays in different areas to go to air, uh, other places where they know there's certain kinds of resources that aren't available at the base camp. But they come back, you know, pretty quickly. At, at other times of the year, the large groups will break up into smaller groups, micro bands, that go off in different directions to use resources they need, but also because there aren't enough resources to maintain a large group for any length of time. So it's this kind of se seasonal pattern of what we call fission and fusion. Fusion is when they come together. Fission is when they break up into smaller groups. And we've, uh, anthropologists have documented this kind of pattern uh, in different parts of the world. So it's not just the figment of somebody's imagination. Uh, the little squares in this thing are referred to resource procurement camps. I don't particularly like the term, uh, aside from being you know, wordy. Um, basically, it means some place where somebody's going to get stone to make stone tools or harvest some uh, uh, nuts, some chestnuts, uh, or maybe just a little hunting camp to go out and get deer because if you got enough people living in one area, for a, short, for a certain period of time, you're going to kind of use up the local game resources. And this is the uh, a more spe a specific model that I've come up with based on the work around Mattawoman Creek. This is this Creekside site here, and this is a relic stream channel coming through, but this is the current Mattawoman Creek. And these are these two sites up in the uplands. So I think, that these, uh, that people traveled from here to here at certain times of the year and other sites we've not yet identified in the area. And that, and even from here, they may have moved on to others, eventually coming back to the base camp site, probably in the spring. Um, I just want to throw one little caveat here in that just because we have a relic stream, and this is a site that uh, uh, Olivia and Amy and I worked on along with George Reisling just a couple of weeks ago in Prince George's County. We were working this field here doing shovel testing. This weedy area over here, that's a relic stream channel. That's where the water Piscataway Creek used to flow or one of its tributaries. Uh, and so if you walk down there now in amongst these weeds, you look at the ground, it's all gravel. Uh, but it was a stream channel. And so we expected to find a site up here and I expected to find one of these terminal archaic sites. And we did find material, we did find a site, uh, which you can see here. Again, these are shovel test pits and this red dotted line more or less demarcates the limit of the site. But we found a total of 52 artifacts um over a lot of holes and we found only one artifact that we could date and it's one of these susquehanna broad sphere points that dates the terminal archaic so there was a terminal archaic site here but there's uh very little firecrack rock only seven pieces there's no indication that it's anything like uh the site that we found along the matter woman creek so all these terminal archaic sites if you find them on little flood plains along uh former channels of creeks that doesn't mean they're all going to be the same. Um, so how they fit in the model yet, I'm not sure. And that's just a close-up view of that puppy. Okay, so kind of getting ready to wind this up here. So in, in doing, focusing not on just, not on the broad Native American history questions, but focusing on this particular period, the terminal archaic, can we link these small upland camps to these larger aggregation sites down by the major waterways. 
That is, can we say that these two, two upland sites necessarily are associated, occupied by the same people as the folks who live down by the creek? Um, do we have something like this going on? Can we identify this model on the ground? And I'm suggesting, yeah, because we've got the Westwood site is here and the two Chris and the Christopher sites are up here and there are probably more of them we haven't found yet. So I'm saying that this generalized model, this theoretical model, may be applicable to real life situations, actual sites that we can find and explore. Second question is when we find these pairings of base camps with these smaller seasonal camps, can we actually see those things move across the landscape over, over the millennia? And you know, do we have something that looks like this? And this is just, I just drew this line, it looks supposed to be a river. You know, it's not any particular river. Uh, with streams coming into it. And so at, especially at these confluences, but not necessarily just the confluences of streams, do we have a base camp with a series of two or more of these smaller camps located further in the uplands, away from the main body of the creek? And can we do that for, a region, for an entire region? Identify a series of these base camps that may be separated in time, maybe contemporary, but maybe separated in time by decades, if not centuries with associated small upland camps. Because when we do that, we start getting away from prehistory. And we start looking at history, we can actually see villages and little satellite villages or camps, if you will. We don't know who lived there. We don't know what they call themselves. We know we'll be able to figure out approximately when they lived there. Uh, we can assign names to them. We can call this the, the Jim Gibb village over here, for instance, uh, with the Jim Gibb Jr. You know, satellite villages out there. Uh, we'll never actually be know the names that those people applied. But still, we're, without the names, we're still getting a, a sense of the past, a sense of that history of these folks. And then finally, can we identify the formation of village life, the kind of village life that Captain John Smith uh, was documenting in his voyages around the Chesapeake in 1607, 1608. Uh, even though they're three to 4,000 years later, can we see the beginnings of uh, more or less permanent villages emerging from that terminal archaic period simply by, again, mapping out these pairings of villages and, and uh, temporary camps through the millennia up to the year 1600. Um, I think the answer to all these questions is yes, we can do these things. Uh, however, we haven't. It requires a lot of work to try to figure out how we get from those little scatters of rock to the development of these villages that had an identity that people had names for themselves and their villages. That doesn't mean they didn't mix and match. Some of these villages probably came together periodically and then parted company. Uh, the names probably changed. And that's part of the history. Uh, these people, Native Americans are not um, some sort of monolithic whole. They, they, uh, they made choices. Uh, they developed new relationships, new ways of earning a living, new technologies. And that, those changes, that history can be documented, I think. Um, it's just gonna take a lot of work. Anyway, that's about all I have. I'm going to stop sharing the screen um, so I can bring back my video. <laughs> there I am. So anyway, that's what I've got for this evening. Um, I think it's a great um, research topic. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people can work on this with professional archaeologists. Uh, and I think it's time that we start doing this kind of work. In my opinion, uh, the archaeology we're doing today on Native American sites, you know, we use new technologies and whatnot, but our questions haven't really changed very much. And what we know about Native American history has not changed very much over the last 30 years. 
And so I think we need ideas like this to start pushing us forward uh, and to start getting away from prehistory and start talking about Native American history. So I'll take any questions, far away. I have a question, Jim. Hmm? Do you assume that your micro group is usually along the water? Uh, Do you look for them along the water? Uh, we, I think we almost invariably find Native American sites associated with some sort of water source. Okay. In the uplands, it tends to be springs and small spring-fed streams. And then down on the floodplain, um, we find, tend to find the larger sites. If we find an archeological, a Native American site, and there's no water around, and I can't think of any instances where that's happened in my experience, uh, but it's probably because that water source doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And you know, springs disappear. We know this at Smithsonian, you know, in the historic period, where poor agricultural practices led to a lot of displaced sediment erosion and essentially filled in a spring. Uh, so there's a, a ravine uh, where a stream used to flow and the only time water flows in and out is when there's a heavy rain. The spring has essentially been buried. Uh, and so that probably happens with Native American sites too, uh, if we find one that's not associated with an obvious body of water. And how do you even know what direction to go out to find these macro sites? You just do the small digs? Well, a, a lot of my work as a consultant, not as a, you know, work with the Smithsonian, but as a commercial archaeologist, I'm told where to dig. Some developer uh, wants to develop a tract of land, and that's where we look. And the research questions sort of depend on what we find there. Okay. Um, and I look, I like sites like the one we just did in Prince George's County. I, I like to um, get contracts like that because there's a chance of furthering this particular research interest. And I guess we did further it, but not in the direction I expected. Um, but if we just had, if we could just roam around the, uh, the landscape and dig wherever we wanted to and not have to ask property owner permission and, and there was somebody to pay our mortgages and everything, um, uh, we could develop a research design where we find ideal places along say Mattawoman Creek and we find ideal places in the nearby uplands where we might find intact sites and we go ahead and test them. But you know, we don't live in an ideal world. Uh, most people, if I asked them to dig on their property, they would tell me to get the hell off their property that they call the sheriff. Um, or they just look at me like I had two heads. Uh, but in some parts of the world, that's how it works. There's a lot of land that's not claimed or it's owned by, you know, controlled by governments. And so it's possible to do that kind of research. It's not possible in the Eastern United States. Every bit of land is owned by an individual or corporation. Uh, in some cases, you know, we have parklands and whatnot, and there it's po possible if we get the permission of the landowning agency. So that slows down the research a little bit. Yeah, and of course there's no funding for it. You right, know, right. with the kind of work I do, the funding comes from developers. Right. Um, but without them, the amount of grant money available is pitifully small. Right. Other questions? Okay, I took you off mute. Hey, Kim Hello. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, <it is. laughs> what, what, who named all those villages on John Smith's map? Where are they? No, who named those villages on John Smith's map of 1612? And why is it oriented? Uh, west to the east and so north to south. Okay, well, there are two very different questions there. The north-south <laughs> thing, um, most of the 17th century maps, unlike today, are oriented with uh, north to your right, and the top of the map is east, is west. Uh, and there is a lengthy cartographic history there. It has to do with Christianity and where Eden is located. And also the very practical fact that Europeans were coming here, you know, heading westward from Europe. So, you know, they're heading west, they hit the mainland and, you know, they start mapping what's in front of them and west turns out to be the top of the map. Um, in terms of the village names, arguably Captain John Smith named them. 
Native Americans told him what these places were, but he wrote them down. And my guess is he wasn't very fluent in any of the Algonquian languages. So whatever he wrote down is sort of his attempt at phonetic spelling. I remember at this point in European history and English history, there was no consistency in how you spelled English words, never <laughs> mind Algonquian words. Um, so there are almost certainly perversions of what people told them. And also, in some cases, he may well have understood, misunderstood, or the Native Americans misunderstood the question. So he was asking what this place was called, and they thought, it, you know, he might, they might have thought he was asking something else and answered. And so the name they gave him isn't necessarily, the word they gave him wasn't necessarily the name of their village or their people. So it's, it's, it, 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 it's a map. <laughs> <laughs> places on it they're relatively accurate but um you know you, you wouldn't mail christmas cards on the basis of that map okay <laughs> thank you kimosabi kimosabi you know what that means don't you <laughs> yeah good friend it's a spanish uh, ki mosabi means he who knows everything or most and that was oh. Echo's word for the lone ranger a little bit of racism um, that story uh, uh anyway any other questions no other questions um anyway uh so next month uh Jim, I, I think there are a few questions on in the chats area oh, are there? okay well far away then all right i can read them i, I can open them but um, I here's a here's a thank you this was extremely interesting um here's another one how far apart are the westfield and christopher sites how long was the walk between them oh god i had measured that actually at one point it's it's under two miles uh, these folks didn't necessarily have to go terribly far that said native americans apparently had no qualms about walking very long distances you know, we know in this region, the Iroquois from upstate New York, uh, you know, the Great Lakes region, uh, war parties would walk down here uh, to fight, you know, Native Americans down here. I don't know how many hundreds of miles that is, but it's, it's, it's a hike. Um, but I, I, sus uh, I suspect most of these folks didn't go terribly far. It wasn't necessary. It was just necessary to establish enough room so they use up old firewood in one area, for instance. Because, you know, you're just picking up dead trees, dead branches to build fires with. And that's a resource that can be exhausted very quickly. Uh, game like deer um, and, and other resources that really weren't hard to get. But if everybody lived in one area for more than a few weeks or a couple of months, those resources would be exhausted. and They'd have to go further and further. Uh, so I would say... Uh, my memory's not good. I'd say under 10 miles, in it, uh, under two miles. Okay. Uh, here's another one from Chloe. Do excavations of the later sites ever show continuous occupation from earlier times? They do. And frankly, it's a problem because we don't get a lot of soil development in this part of the country. So the earlier stuff and the later stuff tends to mix vertically and becomes difficult, in many cases impossible, to separate stuff out that was left four or 5,000 years ago from stuff that was left 1,000 years ago. Certain kinds of artifacts, pottery and projectile points, we can date. But most of those, you know, the, the waste from making uh, stone tools, those flakes, the firecrack rock, you can't tell who left that behind if you have a, what we call a multi-component site. Now, sometimes we can separate them out spatially. So they're all at the same kind of elevation, but you get one area of a site of a couple of acres where there's a cluster of material and all the datable artifacts of just one period. And another part of that couple acre site, you get another cluster of material with differently dated material. So they're still occupying essentially the same landform but there's enough spatial difference that we can tell them apart. We could do some interesting research. But when they're stacked one on top of another, we have sites in Maryland that have been occupied, you know, from maybe not the Paleo-Indian period, but earlier Middle Archaic, 
up until the late woodland a period of you know thousands of years. One site you'll find material cheek by jowl with thousands of years apart. And to me, those kinds of sites are very useful. In fact, they're for me, they're kind of a waste of time because they have very little research potential, in my opinion. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, the next one is, Jim, have you been involved in the St. Mary's City recent find behind the college? I'm gonna ask you to hold on just a moment. Okay. Sorry, I have three dogs and one of them is a border collie. He's not happy unless he's barking. Um, no, I, I don't work with the uh, uh, Historic St. Mary City Commission. Um, I volunteered a couple of times many years ago. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't, what I know about what they've been finding and doing is what you know about from the newspapers. Uh, the finding of the fort with ground penetrating radar, uh, which they did about three years ago and just recently released the information on it. Um, I had nothing to do with that. I'm a, I follow it, I'm re really interested. In fact, we have, we have a conference coming up in the first weekend in November at St. Mary City. It's a regional conference, the Council for Northeast Historical Archeology. span And I'm guessing that their recent find is gonna, um, there's gonna be some talking about it at that meeting. And it's right at St. Mary City, so it's local. You'll probably see if they're going to have some things for the public so folks can get in and hear about the latest finds. That's interesting. Does anybody else have any questions? I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay, um, okay well, I, Jim, as we talked about when we first started, the next program with you will be July 26th. It'll be a Monday evening. And the title is Dinner at William and Mary Goes Plantation. Do you want to say a, a little bit about that? Yeah, that's uh, that's virtually hot off the presses. The report just went in a few months ago. It's a early to mid eight, uh, say about 1720 to 1770 plantation site in Bowie, Maryland. Uh, not just a stone's throw away from the Bowie Bay Sox Stadium. Uh, a huge amount of bone. Um, some really interesting uh, architecture, a um, couple of privies <laughs> that we dug out. Uh, uh, Olivia, I've, I'm sure I've got a couple of pictures of Olivia at the bottom of one of them. Uh, so we got some neat stuff out of there. It's, a, it's an unusual um, site, an unusual collection of material. And I'll probably compare it a little bit to some other uh, early colonial sites that uh, I've excavated in the region over the years. Uh, and it, it's a project that's uh, part of, uh, I hope, a book on colonial dietary patterns. Um, but it's an interesting story and I hope to see you all there next month. <laughs>